Welcome to the inaugural edition of Vital Talks. This is a big day for us, one that we've anticipated for months, one that many of us have been looking forward to all winter. Yes, it's opening day for the New York Yankees. <laughs> and for those of you from Queens or who care about the Mets, good for you, but go, <laughs> go Yankees. Um, so thanks for coming, seriously. Thanks for coming. We're pleased to host you in our new headquarters. And if you have a chance, please walk around to the fifth floor as well to see how we roll around here. Lots of meeting rooms, and um, but it's an open space environment, and we're really, really enjoying our new space. Thank you, Jose, wherever you are, for enabling that to happen. Uh, it's great to see many uh, important people here. All of you are important, but I wanted to just acknowledge the health commissioner, uh, Dr. Barbeau, Dr. Oxir Barbeau, thank you for, so much for coming. Um, Dr. Uh, David Caputo from our board of directors, thank you, David, for coming. There are a few other people that I haven't had a chance to meet, but I'll just call out your names because it's protocol to do so, so let me do that. Um, from Mayor de Blasio's office, Diana Martinez. Um, from uh, the CDC, Florina uh, Sebastu is here. Is she here? There she is. Um, and uh, uh, Doc Salam Gouyer, the WHO representative from Mauritania, was, I think, going to be here, but I'm not sure if he's here yet. Um, and also uh, Natalie Menab, Menab, Menab Ne from WHO, so also welcome. Um, and welcome to all of you from government, foundations, nonprofits, to all of you leaders who've joined us here today. So thanks very much for coming. Also, thank you to my colleagues from Vital Strategies who are also in the room. So Vital Talks is designed to bring together, and I should mention before I, I, I get into that, that we also have people uh, who are joining by web stream, so welcome to all of you. I know that people from as far away as Australia, China, India, and South Africa are joining today, so welcome to all of you as well. So Vital Talks is designed to bring together public health leaders to talk about the pressing public health issues of our time. At Vital Strategies, our vision is that every person should be protected by a strong public health system. We began around 12 years ago as a staff of five, myself included, to today when we have more than 400 people around the globe in, and working out of offices in New York, Paris, Singapore, Dar es Salaam, New Delhi, Sao Paulo, and many other countries around the world. In addition to the topic you're going to hear about today, we will also um, be uh, continuing this series with a focus on the overdose epidemic with a special uh, focus on the opioid epidemic. We're going to have uh, talks on air pollution, uh, on the uh, obesity epidemic as well. So I hope that you do tune in for future talks and we'll let you know about those. Today's talk is by Dr. Tom Frieden, our friend and colleague who is the president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives. Resolve seeks to accelerate the implementation of proven strategies to prevent deaths from epidemics and cardiovascular disease in countries around the globe. Tom's extraordinary bio is in your program, so don't worry, I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, notably, though, he was the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Pre Prevention from 2009 to 2017, and before that served as New York City Health Commissioner from 2002 to 2009. Many of us who were colleagues with him then consider those to be the halcyon days of public health in New York City. It is my great pleasure to introduce Tom, who will be speaking to us, us today about government and societal responsibility for control of epidemics, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And after Tom's talk, he'll be joined by Dr. Sandeep Kishore Sunny, uh, Director of the Chronic Disease Action Center at the Arnold Institute for Global Health, and I'll introduce Sunny right before he comes up. So Tom, please, thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those of you uh, web streaming in. To give you the bottom line, and I hope you don't leave after this, but this is the bottom line for what I have to say. Epidemics of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and infectious diseases aren't inevitable. We can stop them. And we means a combination of government and civil society. Not all of them, but many of them, maybe even most of them. And what that means is we have a unique responsibility to scale up our efforts to implement programs that work but aren't yet being widely implemented. Uh, Sandy's conceived of this series as really a chance for interaction and discussion. So I'll 
go through some slides quickly, but open up for uh, ongoing discussion and interchange. Fundamentally, what I'll be talking about are what I see as some of, not all of, but some of the key tipping points for 2019 in global health. We're either going to go from cycles of panic and neglect to focused closing of gaps in epidemic preparedness. Because we've had cycles of panic and neglect for a long time. I was chatting with some of you earlier about the measles outbreak uh, now and all the attention to it. And remembering when I started as an epidemic intelligence service officer in New York City in July of 1990, and we had a big outbreak of measles and hundreds of cases, dozens of deaths, um, very challenging outbreak to control, many of the cases in infants younger than six months of age, so they couldn't be effectively vaccinated. And that outbreak led to the Vaccines for Children program, a program which uh, helps vaccinate about half of all the children in the U.S., and which, when H1N1 influenza hit the U.S., enabled the rapid scale-up of effective vaccination coverage around the world. The second tipping point is, will we just continue hand-wringing as our plan of action and neglect, or will we take effective action against the leading killers, non-communicable diseases, heart disease, stroke, cancer, and diabetes? And third, in this year of so-called universal health coverage, or UHC, will it be empty declarations or will it be actually the development of high-quality primary health care? And I think that's what's in the balance. At Resolve to Save Lives, we have two broad areas of effort. The first is to partner with countries to make the world safer from epidemics, particularly by strengthening areas such as uh, uh, laboratory networks, human resources, emergency operations centers, um, and uh, trained disease detectives. And second, uh, preventing cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is the world's leading cause of death, 18 or 19 million deaths a year, 10 and a half million from hypertension alone. And our, our Zen koan of, uh, of our cardiovascular program is, when does 50 plus 30 plus zero equal 100? Well, if we can get to 50% hypertension control from the current global rate of 14%, reduce sodium intake by 30%, and get to zero grams trans fat, then we can save 100 million lives over the next approximately 30 years. To make progress in public health, based on my work here with so many of you and in CDC and globally, fundamentally takes three things. First, technical rigor. You've got to get the details right. You've got to have a technical package which, if implemented, will get the results that you need to implement. Second, you need operational excellence. That means doing it well. At CDC, we used to say that the secret sauce of CDC was the combination of an epidemic intelligence service officer or an epidemiologist along with a public health advisor or outreach worker to enable us to not just know what to do, but to get it done well. And in operational excellence, I think of tuberculosis control, where the approach really is to track every single patient put on treatment and be responsible for their outcomes. And third, uh, political support. Nothing is possible without political support. And that means from the highest levels of government, but that also means civil society pushing and pushing and pushing to insist that society and government made progress. So in the epidemic sphere, we go from panic to neglect over and over again. And we think this is not an inevitable approach. We think there are ways to move rapidly up. And the approach that we're promoting at Resolve to Save Lives uh, here with Vital Strategies is to focus on stepping up, going from red to yellow, yellow to green. And to our pleasant surprise, since the joint external evaluation process was launched about seven years ago, nearly 100 countries have gone through this exercise. This is a rigorous way of countries taking stock of their own level of preparedness. What you see in this um, interesting graph uh, on the top left is, uh, or top, you're right, uh, on, in the rows, different countries that have gone through the process and on the columns, the different capacities. And you can see there's a lot of red, a lot of yellow, not a whole lot of green there. 
Uh, and what that fundamentally says is that the world isn't ready for the next outbreak. And therefore, we will continue to see problems like the Ebola outbreak in DRC, like uh, outbreaks of typhoid and cholera, uh, and many other preventable conditions around the world. But we now have a way forward, and that is to step up, to see that it's possible uh, to go in each of those little boxes. Each of those boxes in that grid represents a really important capacity that can be strengthened and that we think will be strengthened to make the world safer. And this is just an example of one, uh, looking at surveillance data. How do you get from a one to a two? How do you go from red to yellow? Well, you systematically identify which pathogens are most problematic. You track and understand where your gaps are in uh, surveillance data. You train national and subnational staff in analysis and data, data use so people can use the data. Uh, and you check data quality uh, at national and local levels. And for every one of those boxes, there's uh, a set of key actions like that that can make a huge difference. And over the past year and a half, since we launched um, at uh, Resolve to Save Lives, uh, we've worked closely with many countries, particularly in Nigeria, where uh, the World Bank was funding uh, a large project, $90 million, it was not moving. Uh, it's now moving rapidly and making a big difference. And the result is a detection and response time for outbreaks has gone from months to days. And we're seeing progress in many areas. The World Bank has now dedicated uh, over $500 million to closing gaps in the preparedness space. So there's possibility to make progress, but it's going to require all three of those key aspects. Technical rigor to get things like what needs to be done, what will really make a difference right, Second, operational excellence, getting it done. And third, political support globally to provide resources and within countries to scale up uh, programs. There are many barriers to, to uh, scaling up readiness. One of them is that countries are reluctant to borrow money for readiness. And so over the next few months, we have a major effort to try to get countries to, um, uh, and the World Bank to establish uh, what we're calling a grant window for preparedness that would allow countries to get resources to close gaps and create a global public good without having to take money out of their uh, envelope, which is needed for things like roads and bridges that are likely going to be higher priority uh, on the national uh, agenda than training surveillance officers, though not, of, not all of us might agree with that choice. Uh, preparedness also primarily requires ongoing support. And World Bank likes to fund bridges and roads and things that you do once. Uh, training people is things you do, at least start doing once. But many of these resources need to be done year in and year out. And country technical operational capacity can be a rate limiting step. The estimate is that there's a need for about $4.5 billion a year globally and that this would effectively allow the world to close the gaps in epidemic preparedness. We need a new approach to incentivize preparedness, and we think that may happen in the next few months. It would be very exciting. Now, the second broad area that we work in in Resolve to Save Lives is cardiovascular prevention. And for the epidemiologists here, this is an impressive graph. For the rest of you, I'll just say the difference between the red line and the green line is two million deaths a year among people ages 30 to 69 from the leading killers of our day. Uh, the world has come together and made very ambitious goals, the sustainable development goals. Uh, one of them is to reduce early death ages defined as ages 30 to 69 from cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, um, and uh, lung disease by one third by 2030. Now the good news is uh, that green line, uh, sorry, the red line shows where we're, where we're going now. Things are actually getting better. And as Hans Rosling very eloquently outlined in his book, Factfulness, it's important not to lose track of that. Uh, the world is healthier than it's ever been. Uh, water globally is cleaner than it's ever been. There's less of it, but there, it's cleaner than it's ever been. And there are many areas of progress, but we're not making nearly as much progress as we could and need to. And if we were to meet the sustainable development goal of 
uh, one-third reduction, it would mean, compared to current trends, two million fewer people dying each year, tens of millions of deaths going forward. Now, there are areas of progress. Uh, a year ago, we, uh, less than a year ago, we helped launch the Replace Technical Package, and that uh, is a way of eliminating trans fat from the world. Global trans fat elimination is gaining momentum. Already Thailand has banned it since this package was launched. I love this slide because that's a trans fat free pastry from Denmark, the first country to go trans fat free. India has released draft regulations to go down to 2% in fats and oils. The European Union has issued draft regulations to ban trans fat by 2021. Turkey and more than 30 countries have taken steps to move in this direction. High blood pressure kills more people than any other condition, more than all infectious diseases combined. And for every 20 millimeters of mercury increase over a systolic of 115, your risk of cardiovascular death doubles. Primary health care is the most needed, but mo whoops, what happened here? Primary health care is the most needed but most neglected area of health coverage, and providing effective hypertension treatment services both requires and facilitates the establishment of effective primary health care systems. If universal health coverage is going to be more than a slogan, we have to see if systems around the world can actually make hypertension control a reality, going from 14% to 50%. Now, there are lots of reasons why we don't make progress in the non-communicable disease space. Uh, there are conflicts. Conflicts between commercial interests and health, the so-called commercial determinants of health. Undue influence on governmental and clinical policies. Friction sometimes between public and private sectors. Doctors and non-physician health providers can sometimes be in conflict. And pharmaceutical equipment and laboratory industries can not see the value of effective treatment programs. But there's also consonance. Healthier people are more productive and creative. So it may not be in the interest of the tobacco, alcohol, or junk food industry to have healthier food, but it's certainly in the interest of all other industries in society. Healthcare-based policies can increase the health and economic return on health investments, and every society is struggling to pay for health care. If we can make people healthier outside of health care, we can get more value for health care dollars. Public and private healthcare sectors together can increase patient access to care, and team-based care is a huge quadruple win. It's cheaper, it's better, it provides more access to people, and it provides employment. And as has been done with HIV, making services more widely available grows the market. Uh, in general, though, there will of course be winners and losers among the companies. What does it take for government to make progress? Fundamentally, it takes courage, and that includes prioritization. Uh, it's inevitable that many bureaucracies will want for every uh, issue to be addressed, but if you're going to make progress, you're going to have to prioritize. One of the things that needs to be done is taxation. Tobacco, alcohol, sugar-sweetened beverages, salty foods, carbon. This is probably the single most effective way to address non-communicable diseases. Regulation is also crucially important. Smoke-free public places. Nicotine. What will the first country be to regulate nicotine out of tobacco? Sodium levels, trans fat, alcohol sales, drunk driving, healthcare quality. These are all amenable to governmental action. Warnings. Plain tobacco packaging. Front of pack warnings on unhealthy food, as, as well as uh, high-quality campaigns of the type that Vital Strategies does around the world. And transparency is crucially important. It's a critically effect, a, a very effective disinfectant. Uh, there's a lot of industry influence that isn't apparent. By making it apparent, we can reduce the impact. We can enable in healthcare systems every provider to practice at the top of their capability. This will save money and save lives. We can control costs by selecting optimal medications and optimal uh, products. And perhaps most importantly, we can try new approaches, evaluate rigorously, and share the results fearlessly and openly, what worked and what didn't work, so we can learn from our experience and scale up. Finally, I want to point out that these aren't inevitable problems. 
progress is possible with support from Bloomberg Philanthropies and great work by many partners, including Vital Strategies, there's been, for the first time in history, a decrease in cigarettes being sold around the world. Over the past five or six years, uh, a half a dozen countries have helped more than 30 million people quit smoking, saving more than 10 million lives. So progress is possible with focus, with accountability, and with courage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Lots of great food for thought. Um, there are a few other seats in the front row. If I could ask anybody who wants to have a seat to, to come up and do that. Um, so this is the conversation part of the morning, and uh, both Sonny and Tom are going to have a chat, and then they're going to open the floor for questions. Uh, let me uh, quickly introduce uh, Sonny, whose bio is also uh, on the program. Um, but he is, we love, I love that your name is Sonny, by the way. It's such a fantastic. Um, um, so he's the director of the Chronic, uh, Chronic Disease Action Center at the Arnold Institute for Global Health, part of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and a faculty member of Icon's Department of Health System Design and Global Health. He's a biomedical scientist who focuses on chronic disease prevention and control. And we're very fortunate that he is a consultant for the resolve to save lives uh, on treatment access for, for, for hypertension. So we're honored to have you with us. Um, go forth with your conversation. Good morning to everyone. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. I know it's early morning. Um, so as I was watching Tom, um, I was reminded of a lecture that uh, Martin Luther King's children were giving. Um, he was a great civil rights advocate in the States. And they said something that their father had told them is that there are two types of people in the world. There are the thermometers who describe the state of the world as it is. And then there are thermostats who have the courage to actually take action. Now, I can't think of a better thermostat than Dr. Tom Frieden in terms of public health in this country and now globally. So my job is kind of fun. So what I get to do is have a chat with Dr. Frieden to dig just a little bit deeper on some of these themes. And then what I'm very excited about is opening it up with all of you and having a community conversation. Um, so Tom, uh, I want to do three things with you. I want to start with the why, I want to go to the what, and then I want to go to a how. So one of the first whys is, you talked about courage, but one of the things that um, I think people would love to know about is, what is your personal why? When you're at CDC, when you're at New York City, when you're taking on uh, companies, when you're taking on industries, what, what motivates you? To me, keeping it simple is very important. And the bottom line is we can save lives. And how many lives we save depends on how hard we work, how smart we work, how well we collaborate with others and develop partnerships. Our work is about saving lives and it's a privilege to have the opportunity to do that work. Uh, I speak often about my father who was a cardiologist here in New York City. And when I was a kid growing up, I would ask him, you know, what's, what's the meaning of life? And he said, simply, you gotta help the people. And that simple concept, I think, is, is what makes uh, not only an effective focus for me and satisfying, but, but keeps it simple mm -hmm. and makes it possible to keep going. Excellent, so then another question, so follow up. If what the data you showed um, with heart disease, cancers are the leading causes of death, 70% of deaths worldwide, many of them are premature. We've had not one, but two, but three high level meetings on NCDs to drive attention. And yet only 2% of donor assistance is focused on these conditions. Why are the conditions that kill the most receiving the least financial attention? I think there are, there are a few reasons. Uh, one of them is that these are in some ways invisible. Hmm. Uh, when they're so common, people think of them like the weather. We can't do anything about it. We can describe it, maybe predict it, but not stop it. And so there's a misunderstanding, really, uh, of how, how key and how dominant these problems are. When I went to Ethiopia as CDC director for the first time, I gave a talk on non-communicable diseases, and I felt sheepish doing that mm -hmm. because here was 
Africa, AIDS, TB, mm. malaria. And afterwards, I was mobbed mm. by the doctors and nurses at the talk, at talk who said, everyone comes here and talks to us about AIDS, TB, malaria. We actually have those pretty well controlled, which they do. Mm. Uh, all of our friends are dying from strokes and diabetes and heart attacks, and we don't know what we should be doing about it. So there's this invisibility of it that relates in part to poor quality data. Mm. We don't have good vital registration in many countries. And uh, Adam Karpati and his team are working on that here at Vital Strategies to improve it with funding from the Bloomberg Philanthropies as well as the Australian government. Uh, that's one major reason, so it's too invisible. Hmm. Second is, I think, a misunderstanding of agency. Hmm. We, we believe that we are creatures of unfettered free will, that all of our choices are things that we decide to do. But in fact, many of our behaviors are determined by what gets marketed whether you got hooked on cigarettes before you were 15, uh, when you started drinking and how much, how much alcohol is available and how much it costs. So that means that in some ways we blame people hmm. for the non-communicable diseases. And of course, there isn't the argument that uh, it might kill you hmm. uh, if you are in a rich country. So there's less of an argument of the global public good than there is for infectious diseases. Hmm. I think one of the things that will change that is showing successes in programs. And that's why replace artificial trans fat is so important. It's the first elimination program in the non-communicable disease space. Mm. If the world is successful, by 2023, trans fat will be a thing of the past. And no child born anywhere in the world will ever have to worry about or be exposed to this toxic chemical that causes heart attacks. Mm. That one effort will save an estimated 17 million lives over the following 25 years. So then tell me, when you, let's, go, let's go to the what then. So you talked about replace. When you're in consultation with governments to push them to actually adopt this, what do you see as some of the core challenges that obfuscate, frustrate, or slow down progress? Lack of priority to non-communicable diseases is something we see in, in many places. Uh, lack of capacity. Uh, countries may not have the regulatory authority mm. and the politics, the commercial determinants of health. Mm. There may only be three or five or a hundred manufacturers of artificial trans fat, but they're the concentrated uh, interest that's negatively affected. The interest that's positively affected is everyone else in society, but no one ever held a rally, sorry, Oxidis, mm. but nobody ever held a rally on the steps of City Hall <laughs> uh, demanding the general good. And yet that's what we try to promote in public health. So let me just pick up on that. So Tom, I've been an advocate for a while. I've been at these um, UN high level meetings. You've been in, in the executive branch of the federal government. You've been um, a city commissioner of this great city. What tactical advice would you have for civil society to push, provoke, to hold governments accountable in a diplomatic, thoughtful way, but in a way that drives towards the action and away from hand wringing? Yeah. Uh, when I uh, my, the, my first big job uh, finishing training was as uh, tuberculosis control officer for New York City in the midst of what turned out to be the largest outbreak of multidrug resistant tuberculosis ever to occur in the US. Mm. And I was 31 at the mm. time. Uh, my, my brother's a political scientist mm. and he asked James Q. Wilson, who was a colleague of his, uh, what should my baby brother do? And uh, James Q, as he was called, said, he'd better get people outside of the government pushing him to do the things he wants to do. Otherwise, they won't happen and they won't be sustained. And I think that's very important. Um, it's important also to be, um, I, I, there's a balance between demanding the moon and demanding the next step that needs to be taken. Uh, but whatever civil society does, it needs to keep doing it. It needs to persi be persistent, needs to figure out who within government can be strengthened needs to figure out who uh, within civil society can be partners so you can have a coalition pushing together. Uh, just to give you a quick s short story, sure. there was a, a New York coalition to eliminate tuberculosis and when uh, Mayor Giuliani started, and Mayor Dinkins' term was finished, uh, Mayor Dinkins had just committed to renovating all of the TB clinics mm. and there was a lot of concern that this would get cut uh, with Giuliani coming in. And so the New York Coalition to Eliminate Tuberculosis wrote a letter, went to the mayor, will you still do this? 
filtered down to the deputy mayor, the commissioner, deputy commissioner, to me, hmm. to write the answer. I didn't know what to write. <laughs> you know, as a new, new administration, so I wrote this mealy mouth answer. Yes, we'll look at it. Went back up to the deputy commissioner, commissioner, deputy mayor. Got to the deputy mayor, and he wrote on it, no, we're going to build those clinics. And, and that made the decision. Now, the New York Coalition to Eliminate Tuberculosis with that letterhead was one person, Charles Ehlers, a former TB patient hmm. uh, who wanted to make sure that things got done right. Got it. So it sounds like we need a lot more of that on the global stage Absolutely. as well. Tom, so then you know, in your presentation, in the spate of 10 minutes, we went from preventing epidemics to trans fats to hypertension. Governments and even civil society face so many competing interests, priorities. What advice do you have for decision makers on how to prioritize? Choose winnable battles. Choose the things which, if you take them on and succeed, you're going to have a big success. If you don't choose the things that, that are tilting at windmills, maybe you want to choose some of those, but uh, you know, that, that might make a good movie or play or musical or novel, but not necessarily a great public program. Don't put a lot of attention to things that are going to happen anyway. It are the, it's the things that are on the bubble where we can make a really big difference. And if we do, it's going to build confidence because success breeds success. And Tom, uh, this year in 2019, heads of state are going to meet on universal health coverage at the United Nations. There's been a big debate that you've been a part of, of health system strengthening versus disease-specific interventions. Mm -hmm. How do you put all this together for this year for people who are thinking about UHC, primary health care, health systems, and disease verticals? I've always found the, the debate about vertical versus horizontal to be misguided in a way. Um, I'm biased because I'm fundamentally a tuberculosis control doctor, and tuberculosis programs work really well when there are tuberculosis specific staff, not at all levels, but where they make sense. Uh, supervisors, trainers, people who develop technical policies in urban areas, tuberculosis clinics are very important. And yet it has to be part of the broader health system. Uh, the biggest gap we have in health coverage is primary care. Mm. And I've watched with some dismay as this debate has, uh, or mm. commitment has spread globally First, there's the risk that it's just words on paper. Right. Second, there's the risk that as it plays out in country, it exacerbates the over-focus on tertiary care. Hmm. Uh, yes, we need dialysis, but how about hypertension treatment to prevent people from having kidney failure so you don't need as much dialysis? So let's pick up on that, Tom. This is something I've teamed up with you on, and it's, you've called it a puzzle. Um, what surprises you about getting access to these essential antihypertension drugs worldwide to prevent the dialysis of sequelae? It's, it's, uh, it is a puzzle. On the one hand, we found prices around the world that may be as low as 2 to $5 for a whole year of treatment for hypertension. On the other hand, the differences between uh, drugs that are perfectly good and drugs that we think are probably optimal are not small. They may be two, four, five-fold. So how do you get good quality, safe, effective medicines out widely. Uh, our goal isn't very big. It's only to treat, you know, another half a billion people. <laughs> so how are we going to do that effectively? Uh, governments and private sector and patients, uh, unfortunately, may need to pay more, but at least they shouldn't pay more than they have to. Hmm. So we talked about a transparency and accountability, Tom, for governments. What about the role of industry? And how do you, what sort of counsel do you have for government or civil society on engagement of industry on, say, trans fats or, or even on price reductions for drugs? Well, the three areas that we're working in have really interesting intersections with industry. For trans fat, uh, we just got excellent technical comments and advice from a major multinational corporation giving advice to any industry or country that wants to promote healthier oils. Uh, it's not simple. When you get rid of trans fat, there are certain products that are harder to replace it in baked goods, uh, pastry, uh, but it's possible. And it's possible to do that in the healthiest way. Industry has important knowledge. Uh, we now have a project we just announced last week in Nigeria and Pakistan, mm -hmm. working with the Sun Business Network and GAIN uh, Micronutrient Fortification Program to see if we can help small scale manufacturers not just get rid of trans fat, but promote healthier oils. Mm. In the area of uh, sodium reduction, mm. we really do want to work with industry to reduce uh, sodium content 
in Thailand, the noodle industry all got together and agreed a 5% reduction in one year and further reductions in future years. And we know that 20% reductions of almost all products nobody notices. Hmm. Uh, there's also the interesting product of low sodium salt, 10, 20, 30, 40% sodium, uh, sorry, potassium replacing the sodium. For anyone who doesn't have kidney failure, that's going to be a real plus because you get a double bonus. You have less sodium and more potassium. And most people around the world consume way too much sodium and way too little potassium. And that ratio is really important. We're probably not going to see massive programs for low sodium salts, but if the industry that sells them does well, we'd be really happy. Yeah. On the hypertension area, yeah. uh, w we've seen a challenge of the market, challenge with, anti, uh, with uh, blood pressure monitors, for example, uh, a lot of low quality monitors in the field non-validated, mm. um, and in medications, this challenge of how do you get uh, reasonably priced medicines out widely. What lessons from the, your, your time as a TB doctor kind of translate to what you're doing now? It all goes back to TB. <laughs> uh, and the, the key lesson is about accountability. Mm. Um, I was not far from here um, uh, at a lunch in Chinatown with Carol Stieblow, who created the DOTS strategy. And Steve Blow said, it's really very simple. Tuberculosis control is very simple. There's just one rule, no cheating. Every single patient you start on treatment, you are responsible for their outcome. Doesn't matter if they were treated in the public sector, the private sector, they moved to another state, you've got to track them. Uh, and, and that fundamental accountability, I've been looking for 15 years as uh, New York City Health Commissioner, uh, CDC Director, is there any other clinical program that can develop that kind of accountability system? You haven't seen it? Not yet. Okay. Um, wait, ten minutes left? Or? Okay, perfect. Um, so Tom, one question is, out of all the things that you've seen, and say apart from TB, and let's say even apart from tobacco, what are the most effective examples of an intervention that has scaled across many of these countries? Well, I, I wouldn't want to leave tobacco okay, out, fine, fine. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about something else as well. Uh, the progress in tobacco is, is somewhat of an unsung story, and it's a lot, lot farther to go, but it's going well in many ways, despite tremendous opposition from the tobacco industry. And uh, I, I think, again, back to the Rosling point about progress, we have to acknowledge that yes, we're seeing declines in smoking rates. Yes, we're seeing real progress in smoke-free policies, but not nearly enough. Mm. Um, but this is a project where you have a technical package, you have operational excellence, you have political support, and you can see rapid progress. I would say the, the other area that really has scaled wonderfully is vaccines. Mm. Uh, polio uh, uh, specifically, but uh, measles, despite the problems here, measles used to kill a half a million kill kids a year. Um, and it's now down to less than 100,000. That's still way too many. But we've seen a lot of progress around the world with two dose uh, measles vaccinations. We've seen new vaccine introductions uh, with rotavirus and pneumococcal, haemophilus. Uh, when I was a resident, we had tons of haemophilus disease. It's gone. So um, the, the vaccine programs combine that technical rigor, a really good product, operational excellence, um, immunization registries and high quality surveillance, which is crucially important, and political support with things like Gavi, which have been game changers for vaccine access. What, what advice can you give this audience or folks watching um, on live stream to drive that political will um, when you haven't seen it? I think you have to make the names and faces real to people. It's not just about numbers. It's about someone's mother, father, child, brother or sister. It's about whether someone can go to work in the morning. And uh, what we did in New York City when we uh, uh, promoted the Smoke Free Air Act, we identified bartenders and waitresses who went to city council and said, I am risking the life of my child every single day because you haven't passed this bill. Hmm. That's yep. an unanswerable uh, objection. It's an unanswerable argument. So I think we have to make the, the lives, the names, the faces, the stories real. And Tom, you, you've talked about cardiovascular disease. We talked about cancer prevention. Tell me a little bit about the preventing epidemics work and how do you incentivize preparedness alongside doing uh, this work on NCDs? 
Interestingly, in, in both the hypertension program and the epidemic prevention program, when we go into countries, we're pushing through an open door. Hmm. Countries want to do this. Um, the challenge is the, the creaky government systems. Can you hire enough people? Can you hire the right people? Can you supervise them? Can you get them money so they can travel? Can you get them computers so they can look at the data? Uh, a lot of the problems are nitty gritty problems. And uh, we think, again, that, that triad is important. The technical excellence, making sure that there's a clear pathway of how to step up. The operational excellence, and actually our staff is in Rwanda today hmm. on a training of uh, 29 um, excellent public health leaders from around Africa, seven different countries, a training in program management and emergency preparedness, so get that there. And then political support, and we're really hoping that the World Bank and the board of uh, the World Bank will approve a new grant window that will begin to close a large part of that gap. I just had a conversation late last night with someone who's working on this, and if we can get it right, he, uh, this person had kind of a light bulb moment. He said, that would be like the Global Fund for Epidemic mm. Preparedness. That would be like the Gavi of global, uh, of global preparedness. And it, it can happen in the next three months. So Tom, w one of the things I, even with my colleagues at Vital Strategies have been thinking about is how do you prepare and equip the next generation of leaders, the sort of young folks around the world, Suppose that money comes, are there even people who are trained, equipped to deliver, in your view, on modern public health issues? One of the things we have to do is to grow more champions. We have to identify and strengthen people who are really effective, who are tomorrow's leaders. I would say one of the things I'm most proud of from my time at CDC was uh, creating the, uh, the uh, PHAP program, Public Health Associates program. Now a thousand people have gone through this program, 40% African American, 15% uh, Latino, Hispanic, and uh, they are really the next generation of public health leaders, all of them terrific. They've worked on the front lines of public health in uh, states around the U.S., learning what public health is. And we need more programs like that in more places. The field epidemiology training programs at CDC, uh, programs to foster people's progress. And I don't think we've figured out all the ways to do it. So that's one area that we need to continue to develop. Yeah, and I, I would say that people are in desperately uh, seeking mentorship and guidance on how to on how to build their careers in this space. Yeah, I, I, my staff would <laughs> would blame me if I didn't mention linkscommunity.org, oh, right. okay. uh, which is a global community to try to build the cardiovascular prevention space, and has now people from more than 60 countries, uh, m webinars, online materials, and an increasing uh, suite of activities to build community. It's really exciting to see the lessons being learned among countries, between countries, and shared from one country to another. Fantastic. All right, I have one or two more, but then I want to prime the audience to get ready because we're going to turn over to you guys. So Tom, going back to, we started with the personal. I want to return to the personal for you for a moment. What in your career, resolve to save lives, protecting the nation's south at CDC, working at New York City Department of Health, TB, has surprised you the most? Wow. Um, I don't know. I have to look at <laughs> my staff. W when was I ever surprised? Uh, I, I have to say that Ebola hmm. was surprising because the moment of maximum terror was when Ebola hit Lagos. Ebola hit Lagos, and Lagos has 10 times, literally 10 times the air transit of the three West African countries that were affected combined. Hmm. Uh, the population of Lagos is roughly the population of those three countries. And we had already seen that once from June of 2014, it was very clear, once Ebola hits an urban area, it's really hard to control. People who are sick have taken uh, three motorcycle taxis and four other ways to get there. How do you trace all those people? Very, very difficult. So if Ebola had gotten out of control in Lagos, uh, and it was within days of getting out of control, it would have undoubtedly spread widely throughout Lagos, widely throughout Nigeria, and likely widely throughout Africa. And Ebola doesn't just kill people from Ebola, it shuts healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. It stops immunization programs, it stops cesarean sections, it stops AIDS, TB, malaria treatment. And uh, we were able to document in Guinea that more people died from malaria because Ebola shut the system than from Ebola be because of Ebola. Um, so this moment of terror was, was maximal, and uh, what made the difference was the polio eradication infrastructure. Uh, 
the folks from polio eradication who snapped into place, put in an incident management system, were able to do contact tracing, good education, established isolation facilities, and they really made all of the difference. And that's an example of how if you build public health capacity that's scalable, it can make a huge difference. Wonderful note to end on. Um, so I think my colleagues uh, will have microphones in the, uh, in the audience. And so let's start with any questions. And, and when, you, um, uh, when you have a question, please uh, state your name. Emmanuel Darkord, I'm a consultant at Vital Strategies. Thank you very much. I wanted to probe on the third part of that triad, the political one. A lot of the examples you've given, including in the most recent answer, have focused on the kind of top political issues, convincing decision makers. Um, related to Ebola, and arguably with the most recent, uh, the current uh, Ebola epidemic, and even with the measles outbreak, the other issue is the kind of a failure of trust, say, between Johnson mm -hmm. Sirleaf and, and her people, and, and um, in Congo between the authorities and the people. Is Resolve addressing this, and, and if so, how? Well, in the areas where we work, we, we focus on engaging communities, building trust. I think your question is a broader one, though, which is um, how can we work effectively in areas where governance is so problematic? I think there's an enormous parallel between what's happening today in DRC with Ebola and the continued spread of polio in Afghanistan and Pakistan. You have areas of the world where public services are minimal experience with authorities is negative. And I if you put into that mix uh, a disease that people are not familiar with or don't see much of, and a lot of effort to deal with it, you're going to amplify suspicion. Uh, why are you really here? I, uh, uh, Dr. Salam Gay is here from Mauritania, and uh, unforgettably, we met at the airport in Togo, was it? as he was on the way back from Guinea, and I was way on the way to Guinea, it was, it was a terrible airport, I gotta say. Of all the airports I've been in, it may be the worst. Uh, no food, no bathroom, lots of mosquitoes. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we had a long layover and no seats, actually. But uh, I said, you're, you're just coming back from two months in, in Guinea, what can you tell me about what's going on there? And Salam flipped open his computer and gave me a brilliant briefing on everything that was going on there, but he also said one thing that really stuck with me. He, and Salam is from Senegal, so he, he's familiar with the area, uh, trained at CDC and, and elsewhere. And he said, the people are saying in the community, you guys say you're doctors. You've been here for 18 months. You haven't treated a patient. So I think in the communities where we're having trouble getting access, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, DRC, we have to provide effective services. We have to provide services that the community sees as valuable, and that will make a really big difference. And actually, Guinea began implementing what they called microcirclage, which was a great program where they went into communities and they provided healthcare services, food, support. They didn't quarantine the communities, but they did track where people were going when they left and came back. And we knew it was successful when the next community down the road said, could we have that too? Instead of saying, what are you doing and why are you doing this to me? So engaging communities is going to be essential to, to disease control. Questions? Yeah. So along those lines, if you could talk a little bit about the attacks on the MSF clinics and DRC. Yeah, the question was about the attacks on the MSF clinics. Um, we saw this in, in uh, West Africa uh, in 2014, 2016 also. There's a lot of suspicion. Uh, there's money coming in. The level of literacy is very low. Rumors spread very rapidly. Um, the rumors that if you go into these centers, they're going to harvest your organs and sell them. So the degree of, of uh, distrust, paranoia, uh, relates to many years of neglect and to really uh, the importance of engaging people from within the community. Uh, someone was recently teasing me about uh, my early time as assistant commissioner in New York City when I was running the tuberculosis program. We were hiring outreach workers by the dozens, and in fact by the hundreds, uh, because we had thousands, actually 10,000 patients to track. So we needed hundreds of outreach workers. 
and we, we hired them anywhere we could. And I happened to be in a cab with a guy who smoked four languages, so I hired him on the spot to work for us, but he didn't work out very well. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing we did do was he offered any cured patient to come work for us. And we had cured patients working for us as patient assistants, patient advocates. And that kind of engagement of the community can make a big difference. Do you have a microphone? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, sorry a lot uh, for coming late. Uh, I was away very late yesterday, and uh, I wanted to come because Dr. Frieden inspired me all the time to hear him. Um, just related uh, to the attack, uh, um, uh, I, 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 I'm in Mauritania now, but uh, on December and uh, January, I was the head of the Ebola response in DR Congo. And uh, my convoy was attacked by uh, armed group, and uh, uh, the UN system resisted. Also, there is other attack that may come from the population, or other attack that may come from a kind of militia that is called Mai Mai. Um, each attack has different reason. For example, the attack uh, from the rebel the armed groups, um, mostly because you are on their territory, you are moving, and they want to show you that uh, we are in charge here. Um, I should admit that the day I was attacked, they could kill me several times, but they did not do it. They just wanted uh, to show me that they are there. For the Mai Mai also, we see the kind of militia that were created to protect themselves against all the armed groups. Um, Any time that they feel the population is being mistreated or neglected, they may attack you. Um, when I was there, um, um, staying on the regulation of WSO, usually I was in touch with the Mai Mai. Um, uh, we would talk to them before to do something and they're going to have the prime of the information um, uh, tell to the population uh, it's fine, uh, there is no problem. Often they don't attack you. But it's a very fragile relationship we have with them that can be broken with everything. So the recent attack with the, to the MSF, I was not there, so I don't know exactly what it is. But just to let you know that each attack has its own cause and it is very difficult to know it. So we are obligated to respond case by cases. Thank you. Mm. Any questions from the audience? Yeah? Okay. You just say your name as well. <laughs> Stereo. <laughs> Hi. It's uh, Betsy, Sorry. Betsy McKay from the Wall Street Journal. Um, just along those lines, what about, uh, you know, what about this increasing problem of epidemics occurring in places, in conflict zones? and? How do you deal with that and what needs to be done that is not being done today? Be interested in what he, both of you have to say yeah, about I, that. I wish I had an easy answer for that. Um, I, I think on, the, on one issue is negotiated access. And for many years, the polio eradication program has worked with the Taliban in Afghanistan to uh, promote polio vaccination. And the Taliban has wanted to demonstrate that it's, it could be an effective uh, in governance. And so generally, that collaboration has gone well. There have been new groups coming in Afghanistan who don't have that same goal, and that has made it harder in some areas. I think, on the one hand, where the security forces can make a place safer uh, for everyone, including for the response, that's very helpful. And there are areas of Pakistan, for example, which are now much more secure and therefore much easier to work in. But the bigger challenge, I think, is a challenge of community development. Um, you have to address the fundamental concerns that people have uh, because that will reduce the cooperation with elements that may be trying to attack the program. Doing that without being seen as a pawn of a repressive government may be challenging. Uh, one thing that is, I think, a good example was the 107 block program in India at the tail end of the polio eradication work there. There were 107 blocks, and a block is a couple hundred thousand people, um, which had very poor access to sanitation. And of course, that relates to polio spreading because it spreads through contaminated water. And there was a commitment to do integrated development there, to build wells and trains and really strengthen it. 
And that was a sincere commitment undertaken by the government of India and followed up and done. However, it was just the making of that commitment that took resistance down so much that really enabled uh, India to get over the finish line in polio eradication. Salam, did you want to say more? Just maybe a... Thank you very much. I think uh, it is a very interesting question. Um, I learned starting 20 years ago when I was appointed as chief medical officer in the part that was on civil war in my own country, in Senegal, um, and later becoming an incident manager in several places of the world with violence. Um, usually, how to deal with violence is whatever is the group. I can't say that they are not bad. There are bad people that are killing innocent others. But also they have some value and some moral. And there is some common value that almost everyone has. First, uh, um, I think, uh, start uh, showing them that, uh, OK, I'm here to help. And don't only say it, you show it. For example, the example I gave to Dr. Frieden in Guinea was that if you have doctor, you should treat people. And if you have money, you should not um, show too much money without giving a way to address the problem they are facing. And uh, also showing them a transparency of what you are doing. Usually, once you build that trust with the population and with those groups, um, they will let you work. It may happen for political reason. They're going to break that uh, trust with you um, that we, you can deal with it. And that is often what I would ask to some of the higher people to continue addressing those things. But in the uh, field, usually that's what I do. I show them that I care, I know what I'm doing, and transparent with them. We have time for one more. There's, yeah, please. You say your name as well? Uh, yes, uh, Florina Serpenescu from uh, CDC in Atlanta. Um, pleasure being here and reconnecting with mm -hmm. our former director, <coughs> who is a personal inspiration for me. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I am an obstetrician by training and epidemiologist, and I would like to um, ask your opinion about how we integrate uh, or increase our efforts to make um, antenatal care more um, uh, focused and more um, impactful, uh, because by screening for uh, non-communicable diseases and advocating for better nutrition during pregnancy, we not only save the life of these mothers, but probably a million of stillbirth children. Mm. Thank you, and I think you will know the answer to that question better than I will, but I, I can just say that uh, maternal mortality is a critically important indicator of hospital and health system performance around the world. It's also a reflection of societal patterns, and we've seen increases in parts of the U.S. because of that. Uh, making sure that every child comes into the world with the optimal ability to reach her or his full potential is one of our most important responsibilities globally. The so-called Barker hypothesis is now proven that prenatal influences determine health throughout much of the life course. Early childhood influences determine much of the life course. So getting the right start with a healthy pregnancy, uh, 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 intended pregnancy, reproductive uh, control by women is crucially important and making sure that the antenatal care is a reflection of uh, societal care is important. I think, though, it may be in some ways similar to the issue of tobacco control. I'm going to make an analogy here. In tobacco control, there's a lot of people who say, well, let's control it for kids and take these efforts to control youth tobacco smoking, but adults, you know, let's let that do whatever it does. And that's really wrong. In fact, what we found in New York City was we implemented only adult-focused tobacco control programs, and the youth smoking rate fell at twice the rate of the adult smoking rate. Uh, the analogy here is that we can't just make a healthier bubble for pregnant women, that we should do everything possible to promote their health. Um, if there's trans fat in the food, too much salt in the food, not healthy places to walk, dangerous roads where people can get run down while they're walking or bicycling. Uh, that's going to affect pregnant women and everyone else. 
But maybe as uh, the group Tobacco Free Kids has done, we can make this effort to promote healthier pregnancies something that will promote healthier societies more broadly, as well as focusing on that critically important time. Excellent. So we've heard about technical rigor, operational excellence, and political will. Uh, Dr. Todd Frieden, thank you for your insights, um, and thank you to everyone here. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you. Just, it, it's just left to me to thank Tom. Thank you so much, Sonny. Thank you so much for a really terrific conversation. Thanks to all of you for coming. I hope you do join us for future conversations of this sort. And thanks to the team uh, at Vital Strategies who helped to put it together. So thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.